Welcome to Music City Revival Podcast, episode number nine. I'm your host, Dan Hagen. We are happy to have our special guest, Asher Laub, today. He's in New York City. Asher is a multi-talented violin player, performer, a breakdancing, cutting-edge, renaissance, revolutionary man, um, and we're happy to have him on Music City Revival today. How are you doing? I'm great, Dan. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I, I'm uh, grateful that you re- – was it your manager that reached out to me, I think, originally? Oh, Sam. A lot, of, a lot yeah. of management for me. Yeah. Well, he's great. And I have to say, like anything, like, you know, when I first got an email, like, you know, I haven't done a podcast episode for a little while. And I've been focused on some other things. And so he sent an email and and I read it and I looked at your stuff and I was just kind of like, okay, I really, this looks really exciting. I'd love to have this guy on, but I was at a place where I just had too much going on to even respond. So I just kept it. And, and then he followed up a couple times and I got to say, that's the kind of guy you want to have in your camp um, because, you know, whatever he's, and he said like all the things because, you know, he reached out and he said, hey, we really like your podcast. We really want to have him on. And then once I took the time to see what you are all about as a no-brainer, I'm like, yes, I want this guy as a guest. But it was that, like, I would have followed up, but that extra touch, I appreciate that professionalism. Sometimes there's people that look at that as, you know, pestering somebody. I'm like, no, I love to, if I want something in the music business, if there's a gig I want or something. I'm one of those people that keep following through. So you've got Sam is a great guy to have in your camp. How long have you been working with Sam? So much. Uh, I've been a couple years now, actually. Okay. Awesome. I I have a number of people on my team. Uh, Thankfully, I'm always kind of, uh, it's always kind of like a work in progress. Definitely. We're always a work in progress because there are just so many facets to being a musician and a performer and having entertainment. And you can't do all those things and still focus on your art, right? So so clearly when I look at your career and you've had great success, you've got a great media response, social media. So clearly you have all the talent in the world. You have a work ethic, but you know how to assemble a team. And isn't that so important to be successful is to assemble a team that many of our artist friends out there can learn from that because – You know, like I have the attitude, you know, as a producer, as an artist, I know what I'm good at. I know what my strengths are and I know, you know, what my strengths are. Like, for instance, you know, I'm recording here at Top Track Studios, this wonderful uh, studio. I'm so happy to have a relationship with Jessica and Gabron from uh, Brazil. And I need Gabron's, you know, skills to do some of the things to work the Skype, to have this mic set up. and, And so... I facilitated this team and that helps me take my vision to the next level. And clearly you understand the, you know, the importance of assembling a team so that you can shine in your light. And, you know, partly in the beginning, I'm sure that you did everything until you got to the point where you're too busy and you, and then you, you outsource, you hired some people, you built a team, right? Is that kind of how it worked for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, this has been years in the running yeah. um, and, and it's, it's still a work in progress uh, because just the work never ends. There's always more. Uh, there's always more to do. But um, c- clear communication, being extremely organized is pretty much the only way to build a trustworthy team. And um, it's, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how many books there are written on this stuff. But uh, I mean, for me, it's just been sort of a game of life experience and uh just realizing that you know you, when you have good support system you don't have to micromanage people as much and sure yeah. and and you know part of finding your team is is usually happens organically when you're out just doing your thing and people come to you and and I think one of the things that you'll pr- probably have seen that I've seen is the people that are qualified on your team are first the people that believe in you, right? They believe in what you're doing because that's the most important thing. It's not about having the most elite team that has the biggest resume. It, it They have to be qualified, but they have to believe in you because when things get rough or when, when there's work to do, that extra touch, when people fundamentally believe in what you stand for, what you're trying to create in the world – That's the most important thing. And, you know, and I tell people, um, you know, even managers, um, 
you know, I've seen every single way it go down where, say, say you have an artist in Nashville here that's getting, you know, a reputation. They're, they're getting on the radar. People are starting to – and sometimes – you know, you have somebody that they're always seeking this big management company that's, you know, working with the biggest artists. But often, if you're not a big fish yet, you get put on the back burner. They don't put any time into you and you really just end up being a write off. So, and hey, if you, that doesn't mean that maybe you do have a big management company that really believes in you. The key is it doesn't matter if that manager or, or that whoever you're working with, the booking agent, part of your team, if they're completely established because all of that can be replaced by somebody who believes in you, who really is willing to do the work and the research, right? Uh, uh, Dan, you're, you're at my mind. Yeah. Uh, we, we, I agree on every aspect that you just mentioned. And it's not about, you know, it, it's not just about the, the big label name. And I've, I've worked with some big labels, um, and I don't want to mention specific ones just in this interview because I'm not trash talking anybody. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think there's there. I I would feel if if I blew up, um, you know, basically where I eat tomorrow and I just, I was doing, you know, a world tour, um, sold out stadium, 40,000 people every single night. I, w- I would want a dedicated team, even a small team of supporters that. Um, that is passionate about what I'm doing, as you mentioned, yeah. as opposed to it sort of kind of put me on the back burner. Uh, also, like you mentioned, so um, yeah, well, what I see in you because we have a lot. We we chatted a little bit on the phone just because I I like to get to know somebody a little bit, you know, before I chat with them, and and we hit it off. We're on the same page. We're both very like savants, just very unique and very. Um, we don't fit in any kind of box at all, right? And so that can be a lo- more lonely road because we don't fit in, say, you know, in Nashville. Like, hey, nobody moves to Nashville to play jazz except like me, you know. I mean, I play all the styles of music, but the point is, is I didn't come here just to be another country guy. I came here to be all the diversity that I am, that I am and I stuck to my guns. And, and there's a loneliness there because if I was just – say, Joe Blow country singer, then I would know just what to do. I'd fit in all the popular cliques and all that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I always like to encourage people, hey, when you're unique, stay true to that. Find out who you are. And just because you don't fit in inside a box does not mean that you're not exceptional. The truth is that I, when I moved to Nashville, you know, I moved from Denton, Texas, a huge music jazz performance school. And of course, I was playing all styles of music my whole life. But when I moved to Nashville, I learned very quickly that in, and it's probably the same in New York in, in any kind of artistic field, that you generally have two to three percent innovators and the rest are imitators is how I think of it. And I think it's how we're created with human nature. Now, when you're an innovator and you're different, you're, it's going to be harder to get that big break. It might take longer. You're going to be more isolated alone. But there's only one Dave Matthews. There's only one Nora Jones. And they paved this whole new trail where all these other artists, they created a market. And and so people like you and I, we have no choice but to be who we are. That's just who we are, right? And so what is it that drives you? Because there's so many different things. I mean, we've talked about the break dancing, and we both kind of, I had it, you know, that in my background growing up in Detroit. But, you know, what is it that drives you as an artist that, that fundamentally that you're inspired? Like, what is your goal with the world? Because I see you as it's more than just the music and it's more than just being a performer. You, you, you are seem like you're driven with, with a purpose that's greater than you. What, what is that? Well, thank you. Um, so I, I, what, what drives me is really connecting with the fans, with uh, connecting with uh, my listeners, because they're essentially what makes me who I am. Otherwise, who am I playing for? Who am I producing music for? And uh, obviously that plus my story and the message behind my story I, and the message that I'm trying to relay to my listeners and anybody else out there in the world, I'm trying to uh, to kind of improve their lives. Um, and um you know, a lot of folks out there, they have a lot of they have a lot of pain in their life, mm-hmm. um, physical, emotional, uh, psychological, all sorts of pain. And um, and a lot of a lot of people turn to music 
to alleviate that pain. Yeah. And, and I've been fortunate enough to be a part of that journey with a number of my listeners, my supporters, who are just really passionate about the messages that I've been relaying behind the music, the original music, uh, and just, just connecting with them, live stream yeah. concerts. That's, I really, that's my drive. Uh, and that's actually why I left, uh, left my career in the sciences because, well, first of all, it just came, kind of came naturally. I was already earning a living in music, but, um, I just, it, it gave me so much joy, so much satisfaction, so much meaning, uh, to, to be able to produce music and connect with listeners who are passionate about that music. Because you're an artist and you are a producer. And so you're producing artists in New York and from all over the world, or is it? So I, I, I'm working with a number of artists. Um, one is in LA right now. The other one is uh, where in the US, in Florida. Um, we are in the midst of a couple of singles releasing. I, I'm producing myself and other people are producing me with every single release pretty much on a monthly basis. So it's just a whole mishmash. I'm, you know, I don't always see myself as the producer and I'm not always the producer. Sometimes I'm the, I'm the soloist uh, and, and I'm working with a guy out in, um, in Germany. Um, Dreaming Awake would be an example if you, if you heard that song. Uh, Brighter Day Ahead, another example where I, I I'm not, I was not the producer. I'm not the sole producer. I was the instrumentalist and kind of created this, uh, this single and, uh, created a message behind it. You can check out the music video on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a whole kind of eclectic mix of, of experiences with each, each and every music release. So I, I love to talk to somebody and ask questions about the fact that you're an artist and you're a producer, but you still bring in, some producers to either co-work with or to produce you. And I can relate to that concept because when I did my first, you know, my, I've, I've been a producer for 22 years in Nashville and even longer in Texas. And, um, when I did my first record, instrumental record, the journey, it was important that I worked with an engineer that was there. We, you know, recorded at, um, at, uh, ocean, um, Ocean Way Studios. And I had Dave Tuff, who's a great producer in his own right, and a friend of mine, and I had him there as engineer. And when we were tracking, you know, the 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 foundation tracks, he was suggesting suggesting things to the drummer that I would normally do as a producer role. But once once I realized that I liked everything Dave was saying, I shut my mouth and I just played my guitar and became in other words, he allowed me I I he knew my vision well enough that I trusted him. He showed me that I could trust him and it allowed me to, to take off my producer hat. You know, maybe in mix, I became more of the producer. But when I was tracking, it was almost too much because it's like it's easier for us as producers to look at an artist. And But when you're an artist yourself, you're wearing your, your heart on your sleeve and sometimes you're biased. So it's nice to have an outside person kind of evaluating the music, helping direct you that you trust, right? Is that kind of part of the idea and, and they can take you to places that you wouldn't normally because you have a certain style of production? Is that kind of what you're looking for in a producer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't always like to be in control. Um, sometimes I like to leave the control to other highly talented, vetted individuals just to take the weight off of me. I mean, I am specific about the product. Um, I want the product to sound good, but, um, it's, it's often relieving when I, it, when, because I wear so many hats in this music career. Um, I have an entertainment group, like I mentioned, um, and I'm doing live performances, which is a whole other bag of worms, like dealing with clients, bookings, that type of stuff. So wearing that many hats is can be tiring uh, and sometimes draining. It's it's tough. It's it's a tough it's it's a tough journey as as uh, rewarding and satisfying as it is. But having said that, back to to what your point was, it's real nice to take a back seat on occasion and. Um, even if I'm like the featured soloist and just kind of let it roll and then release it, if it sounds good, you know, I just want the product to be good. Yeah. And if you're working with another producer, it might sound in a good, in a way that you would have never produced on your own, just because they might, it's one of the, the, um, 
the art of being a producer. Like, I'm sure you've dealt with, like, say you're working with an artist. I've tend to work a lot with female artists in my in my career as a producer, and and sometimes what the artist visions as their sweet spot in their voice, maybe a vocal range, maybe a producer you might go like, maybe they love to like sing high all the time. That's, and, and I might go, you know, there's that middle ground. That's really your sweet. That's, that's the most listenable place. And I really want to capture that. And, and so it's the same thing when somebody's, you know, say producing me as an artist is they might have a different vision of what's the best of uh, in me and pull that out. And I think that isn't that one of the goals of a producer is to pull the best, what you see is the best out of that artist. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's funny cause, uh, the, my mastering engineer I've, I've, I've used for a lot of my projects over the years, Bob Olson was a, a Motown, you know, mastering guy, you know, started in 64 recorded vocals on what's going on and Marvin Gaye. And he's just a wealth of knowledge. Well, one of the things he told me, and I needed to hear this, he goes, you know, Dan, cause there's times where I've I've been a producer for an artist and there was some kind of rub or friction in the project and part of it he said he summed it up. He goes, you know, Dan, great producers sometimes. I've seen it over the years that maybe their re- relationship might even dissolve or be a little bit rocky during the project or afterwards because you're asking an artist who has their heart on their sleeve to to Get out of their comfort zone because that's what it requires to make great art is get out of that comfort zone. And sometimes you might be pushing them in a place that they're not comfortable, but that's what the art requires. And so they might even have a little bit – there might be a little bit rub in that relationship, but it's still – it's your job as a producer to deliver the highest quality art. And sometimes – that means having a vision of that artist that they don't quite see in themselves, right? Do, do you find that um, that sometimes when you're producing an artist, you're taking them to a place that they might not be comfortable with yet, but if they have enough faith, they might go, I'm glad you did that because I wouldn't have gone there or, or just, you know, that kind of idea where you're taking them somewhere they might not normally take their own art. Yeah, I I have... I've had that, you could call it, um, I've had that friction, Mm -hmm. uh, at at various points. Um, when I'm collaborating, like with, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to say one of the more established artists, I, you know, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sensitive about their needs. So I, I'm not too pushy, um, because pretty much my relationship with them is probably more important than like having the notes sound exactly the way I, I need them to be mm-hmm. sounding. Um, but, but yeah, I've had situations where it's like the recording uh, with a little bit of back and forth, like how about this? How about this option? How about four other options? It's sort of worth the effort when it sounds that much better in the end. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's even I've found that in a tracking session, like in Nashville, we still do a lot of things where we track guys in, in a room here. And I'm looking forward to, you know, doing uh, tracking projects here. And I love that, that feeling of having that, that all that real human energy in a room. And, and, but, you know, one of the things that, that I found with working with great musicians, and some of them are producers in their own right, is that, you know, musicians will often have advice. Hey, what do you think about this kick pattern or something like that? Or Dan, what do you think about this? And I always like to entertain the idea. Of course, as producer, I always, you know, have the executive decision to say, you know, which way we're going to go. And if you have too many cooks in the kitchen, you don't get anything done. Um, but, you know, it's it's a it's a great thing. You know, and the greatest... Uh, musicians, they know when to say something and not. In in other words, we have to know as a musician when to wear our musician hat, session player hat, and when to 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 wear our producer hat. And the bottom line is, if you get called for a violin session, I get called for a guitar session, and we're not the producer. It's not our job to tell them how the project goes. And 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 so I've also been in the place. And I don't know if you've been there where you're working with a rhythm section and somebody 
in that rhythm section starts to exceed the role of the hat that they're wearing and they kind of get into producer lane. And I've had some places where there was flat out friction and I had to like resolve it and get through the session and basically ultimately go, okay, that's a great idea, but we're going to go ahead and do this. Thank you so much. And you know, there's are some people, musicians that I was like, okay, that guy can't really take off the producer hat. And it made for a really uncomfortable situation. We got through the session, but I don't think I want to hire that guy <laughs> again. I mean, you know, because that energy, there has to be a flow. And if there's anybody in the room that locks up and is out of that vibe of that human energy, that natural flow, it can really kind of screw up the whole overall recording, right? And so as a producer, we have to be able to be the be be the water guy, the guy that just the smoother, whatever if there's tension, like and part of that is hey, if there's a musician and you just need to massage their ego a little bit to make them feel better and go, hey, that's a great idea. Maybe we'll try that. Maybe you do a pass and go, yeah, hey, that was a great idea, but I think we're going to do it this other way. The artist wants to do it this way. And and sometimes just throwing somebody a bone, you do that because in the end, the energy the music is made with comes out and you want that to flow. You want everyone to be appreciated, right? So there's that, you've got to kind of be the peacemaker too, right? Yeah, um, and... It, so and that that takes real skill yeah. and experience, absolutely. Sure. I know you've been doing it for years. Uh, you, you want good vibes. I yeah. mean, that's the point of making music. So well, and and I see that with everything that you do. It's like you know, I I've you know had limited time with you know senior music, but everything I see, I can tell. It makes me want to know your story now. What what led you to this? Because. One word I would say to sum you up that makes you greater than a musician is is like you're a humanitarian. I see that. You have the joy of humanity. You want to make the world a better place. And I see that and you're able to do that. And it like one of the quotes I like to say is, you know, music is helps us to escape the tyranny of ordinary life. And that's part of what our goals is. Like you said, life is hard, especially, hey, people are dealing with hard financial circumstances right now. So we can be that light, that that departure, you know, and people can sense when that's authentic or not. You can really kind of sense, does this person really about the music, the humanity of it, or is it narcissism, right? There's a huge difference. Like, you know, I, I would never like use that word for you because you're not that. You're very humble. You're very down to earth. And that comes out in the music. But like, what is your story? What led you to kind of you said you were in in science and then you kind of departed into music what led you there yeah sure um but before before i go down that route it was interesting that you mentioned narcissism yeah. because there is a lot of ego in the music industry i mean also sure. another not specific to the music industry but there happens to be that case because you got a lot of rock stars on stage yeah. um but you know an example of i feel like narcissism is like a musician not bothering to take the time to respond to like a, a, an enthusiastic or a passionate fan, like somebody who really like is dedicated to supporting you or to like leaving like meaningful comments or like really showing that they care about your work. So I get like a, a lot of DMS on Instagram, Facebook, and I, I, I often don't have the time to like respond to every single comment, but when I see like the regular, like the, the repeats, yeah. uh, the people that keep coming back and like, they clearly are showing like a love for what I'm doing. I don't want to let them go. Like I, I want them to know, like, I'm not, I don't see myself as like a, this big deal, even though some, even though you're presenting me that way with your comments, um, I'm, I'm a musician and I, and I want to connect with you and, and, and you're the reason why I'm here. And I try to respond to as many comments as I possibly can. And for some reason, Facebook, like, makes it really difficult to post those comments. Like yeah. sometimes I'll get to it if I don't like stand there and like wait. But anyway, I, I just mentioned that because it's important to me as a musician, as an artist to make fans feel like I'm not on this pedestal. I'm not like above you. Uh, and I say that because I, I, you see a lot of rock stars doing that. Well, and it's, I love that how you say that because up on a pedestal, it, I, I kind of see that the old music industry, which I like the, to make the analogy is at best arranging chairs on the Titanic because it's this big morphed model that got out of touch with the people. And the old model was 
you had these narcissists that were bigger than life. They were untouchable. They're uh, on a pedestal. But I think we're in a shift now, especially because of the times we're in. We're all being humbled financially and emotionally in different ways. And so I think there's a shift where the old model of kind of being untouchable you know, the narcissist type of, type of approach, I don't think that that's going to exist much more. Maybe the artists that are already established that, that way, but I, I see more people with your type of attitude that realize that many fans are looking for that that artist that can, they can relate to almost like a a personal hero, like, hey, this is a normal human being that took the the pressures of ordinary life and they they focus on their dreams and they did amazing things and that inspires me to maybe go hey how can i pursue my dreams and i think that's more the successful model that's going to go into the future this more grassroots where where your 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 fan base is your family you're like one you know it's like one big family and I think people like you are – it's a no-brainer you have the talent and all that. But that connection – I noticed that, to be honest, like when uh, I posted something on Facebook and tagged you in, you know, kind of hyping up this. And I remember seeing all the comments from your fans. And I'm like, wow, these are real fans. They're all excited. And it's not like, you know, you paid them to go leave these comments, right? I'm like, these are real fans. And they went to my page – to really like, and I'm like, wow, okay, you've done really well because the the caliber of comments they're leaving were were very like supportive, like they're they it really it's like a what do you call it um, um, a grassroots like support team, you know. And I I got that feeling, so I can tell that you're very connected with them. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I am. Uh, it's always a work in progress, um, and it's not easy. Like nurturing those types of relationships and showing people that they you really care about them especially when they're sending you dms like literally every like hour <laughs> like in like perpetuity it's like you don't have the time to always respond but like you try to respond like every day or, or a couple of days or so um but but these but these are the people these are the messengers for you like these are the folks that share your music with their family and their friends and they're they're the most important people really um, they're the ones I, yeah they build your like, street team right they and they're the ones that will help uh in their local whether they're, they're in missouri or whatever they'll get their friends and help promote your show right uh yeah so what i'm trying to push more right now um is is a live stream concerts even though it's like It's not it's not quite the same as as uh, like an in person tour, uh, but there's something I, I've I've been inspired by a number of musicians out there that are making it work and making a full time living with live stream concerts and also do in person concerts. But like the crux of what they do is they they have like repeat listeners and viewers. They just keep coming back every week, and like that's a beautiful thing. It's supposed to seeing somebody once in like Europe or in Asia or or in the United States, I, I, that's something that's exciting to me. So I'm trying to kind of build that into, it's similar to live streaming, but it's sort of like they support you. Yeah. As, as, Did Was the live streaming, having more of a live streaming presence, was that part of a result of the pandemic that you went into that? Or were you doing that even before? Um, I believe I I did it around the time the, the pandemic oh, yeah. came in, but I think I was doing a little bit, before I, I was testing out all sorts of things during the pandemic because it was just like I, I it was all in for me at that point. Yeah. I had completely dropped my <laughs> my my other degrees and careers. I mean, I, I finished all my degrees, but I didn't pursue those careers. And it's like I, I, I was like telling myself, like, you, you're going full throttle on the music. So I was just testing and taking different chances. And long story short, uh, going going live pretty pretty regularly on Facebook and and uh, there's generally have have a lot of repeats there. You know, one great thing that I noticed cuz you know, I started do, doing live streaming during the pandemic and I never really did that before and and I kind of had the attitude quite honestly, the people that 
say, live stream their whole show, I thought, well, you're not really getting, giving an incentive for the locals to come for your show if they can just sit at home, but maybe live streaming a song or two as a teaser. But now I see it different because I remember one of the great things, the first time I did a live stream, like a legit live stream from Facebook during the pandemic one of the coolest things was that my family was able to hear my performance and friends. I've lived in several different states. And so some of those people that, that generally never have an opportunity to see me perform, they're all of a sudden able to see me perform. And they also tipped very well. So it kind of made me go, hey, you yeah. know, just with the idea that you can play a gig and you can live stream it at the same time is a win-win um, yeah. As long as you're not too absorbed in the technical issues and that becomes a problem. But then you're able to perform for those locals in that region. But then also your international following is able to support you. And if you're really savvy and wise and you have links, uh, you know, you can also gain tips. And because what I realized is that um, oftentimes the tips I was getting from those live streams was more than the gig would have paid. Right. Yeah. But it, then if you get the gig pay and the tips and and keep that engagement with all your international fans, that's a win win. Right. Yeah. And um, like I mentioned, a couple artists I know, they they when they do an in-person concert, they'll do a live stream for their remote fans, ah. which is like I'm, I'm like. When I heard that, I was my mind was blown. because I was thinking, oh, my God, the possibilities. Yeah. Like what? What about like going on tour, playing playing for new folks across the country, and then bringing your live stream fans with you and getting supported that way too? In, yeah. In addition, and uh, that that's something I'd love to do. Because then those people that are supporting you in the live stream, they're really excited for that real live experience when you actually come to their city, and that might make them, you know, go out of the way because they like the live stream so much. Maybe they'll talk to a local venue and go, hey. You've got to have this guy and have the venue reach out to me. Or there's, you can never uh, underestimate. My whole career has has been about like, who do you know? Who does this guy know? And it's all about relationships. And I've learned, I think one of the mistakes I've seen a lot of people that come from that kind of narcissistic type of attitude that everything's about me and getting famous and all that is they'll underestimate the people that aren't you know, necessarily in the music industry and they see them as, well, they can't do anything for me. And I'm like, bro, you have no idea. You might sit in a plane next to some old lady that just wants to have a conversation with you. You have a great conversation. She goes, hey, I'd love to hear, hear your music more. You give a card and you might find out that her son is the president of Sony Records. You know what I yeah. mean? And and that's why it's all about relationships being authentic and not assuming that you know what somebody can do for you because yeah. like I created a whole, you know, jingle production industry and was doing, you know, international accounts because I had a couple of guitar students that one was, you know, did uh, – two of them are producers at CMT and one was a head of an ad agency and I was like – well, why they're talking about doing sessions all the time? I'm like, why don't I get those sessions? So I created a jingle, you know, production company. And I pitched it to those guys at work, and I did it. But you know, it's it's like it's all about. My, my late grandfather did uh, jingles for a number of years. Yeah, and and I I, I I I love that, and I'm and now what? See, I have this new model that I'm kind of like my whole idea of of doing things different because. When I describe the old music industry as, as re- arranging chairs on the Titanic, one big problem is that the industry doesn't have capital. When I moved like it used to, or at least it's what's left is only going to the hands of Spotify and the labels. It's not going to the creative talent, the songwriters, the producers, and the session players, right? But when I first moved to town here 22 years ago, there was a vibrant, healthy industry because there was $17 to split from a CD sale, and so there's more capital. The bottom line is this, that the way I see the music industry is that you have to look at what works and what, how, you know, a label, a studio, a management company, a booking agency, all those roles, but then you have to learn to downsize, do it yourself, and replace those things. But the bottom line is, the industry doesn't have capital. You need capital. You need capital to go on tour. So my attitude is 
teaming artists with other artists, maybe people that are in sports or whatever, and then start working relationships with local companies first, you know, that you believe in. It could be a restaurant, a coffee product. It could be your string endorsement, whatever. It could be in music. It could not. And it's the idea of, you know, jingles is that, you know, you hire a production company to put music out there. So my idea is, hey, you can team artists with companies, whether local or international, and they can help do the branding for that company and work together. That's kind of where my mind is at, because in other words, the industry doesn't have capital per se, but there are plenty of businesses that are are thriving in this economy. There are some that aren't, some are. Well, the ones that are, they've got capital and they're willing to invest money in marketing. And if you can go to them with an idea that, hey, let's say you have an artist that, hey, you work with an artist that's a model that happens to be a model on the side. Well, hey, how about if this artist I'm working with modeled some clothes? Like my girlfriend's had really success like doing that with some companies and and I think that's a great idea is just thinking outside of the box. Hey, you can work with companies and and coexist and co-market and they don't have to be in music. But I think one of the things I've always believed in, you've got to believe in that product. I've never been able to fake anything like – and I'm a great salesman if I believe in something. But, you know, there's been times where I was, uh, you know, worked in sales for a minute at a music store and, and the manager's going, hey, Dan – just sell what we have. It doesn't matter what they're looking for. And, and I always had the attitude like, hey, we're, we're in Nashville. We're dealing with big session players. I'm not going to sell them something they don't want. I will tell them what store has what they want. And then in return, because they trust me, they might come back the next week and buy $20,000 worth of gear for me because I was honest with them. And so the point is like, I think it's good to attach yourself to causes you believe in and companies you believe in their product. And when you do that, you can provide a benefit for both sides. And and that's kind of where my mind is at, is that we can still function in the music industry and do the things that we need to do, but we can team with some you know, companies that might not even be in the music industry that either they're up and coming, they need a new marketing plan, a way to get their word out, and you're out there you know, gaining fans and building a social media rapport. And they might see that as a benefit for their company if you can find a way to kind of team together. Do you find yourself kind of going in those roads at all or thinking about that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, you know, I often think about uh, just, again, considering how complicated it is to be an independent artist. And um, you there's again, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of different hats you got to wear. So um, it's it's hard to have all these talents in many different arenas of your of your life. You gotta to be effective um, as an artist. You need a, you need a team around you and team of supporters, people who can put on those other hats, have those skills, connect with uh, you know big companies to to bring in the revenue. Um, it's it's a lot harder for. For me, and I've done this for for a number of my uh, my music releases, my music videos. I've I've uh, done some fundraising. Uh, companies that actually come to me to support my video. Um, it's not like something that I do regularly that I'm able to do regularly because I don't have a dedicated manager who takes care of that stuff for me. Yeah. Um, but but I think for you to be like I mentioned to be to be really effective, you need like a you need that stuff on autopilot. You need a guy yeah. who's like always got your back in the marketing um fundraising arena whatever for your for your um for your tour for your music video so yeah i would think that somebody like you is dynamic and to be honest i'll probably if i see some companies it'll be like i'll throw them your way because i'm i'm all about like if i when i look at you and and the fact that you dance and I've seen legit you break dancing, that is incredibly visually stimulating and that would make for great ads and commercials. And so whether it be, a, a, you know, an Adidas shoe commercial or whatever, I would say you would be a prize for things like that because you 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 kind of bring that jaw dropping type of sensation. where you are like, holy cow, this guy's really doing that. Like he's playing a violin and he's break dancing and. And there's lights and all that. I mean, you know, 
I think that would be very conducive to to you know for marketing and TV and and that kind of thing. Yeah, I appreciate. That's really nice of you to say. Um, that again, I've I've had I've been fortunate to have a number of opportunities in that regard. But yeah, I, I because I I'm not able to actively pursue these 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 opportunities that they don't always come my way. So yeah, yeah you're really dedicated well, team. I'll send them your it. way. I'll, I'll be that guy. I'm just That's one of those guys that I just, I'm, I like to network and I, and I do it because I like to see people do well. And I like to see, I really believe in this concept of marketing and putting together teams. And so that's where my brain is at right now, because, you know, and that's what I'm going to work on with the artists that I'm producing. Cause you know, often I, I find myself being a, a pseudo manager, probably a consultant more than anything. Cause I don't want to be their full-time manager. I don't want that responsibility. What I say is just, Hey, listen, if I present an opportunity that becomes lucrative in some way that helps your career, just, you know, treat, give me 10 to 15%. Like I, I was your manager or whatever, but I'm not exclusive. I'm just, uh, and I think that's, um, a model that more artists should think about instead of like here, like, here's my full-time manager. Like, well, hey, you know, if somebody's vetting you, they're interested in being your manager, um, I like to say, let them prove they can do something. You know, like, tell them to go book you a gig. Tell them to hook you up with the relationship with the company. Do something. And, you know, and and if they're good and they do well, then you would want to work more with them. But you don't necessarily need a full-time manager, and but it's it's good to – you wouldn't want people representing you that you don't trust and, and bring in bad favor. But there's not a, a – you know, there's not – there's a, a good idea of having some different freelancing management type, type of people that believe in you. They might have some connections and, hey, if they bring a project your way – then yes, you're going to give them a financial incentive, but that doesn't mean that you have to be ex- exclusive to them. And I think that's the problem I find with a lot of artists is they're so eager to get a manager and then, okay, well, have they done anything for you? No. Well, maybe you shouldn't have signed on as an exclu- exclusive manager and, and maybe you should look at it as in a consultant or freelance type of situation, right? So so I have a number of things to say on that and I couldn't agree more. Um uh, you know, I got all these folks like just rushing to to get signed to major labels, and I've read a number of articles and just seen interviews of musicians that just couldn't wait to get out of those deals. Yeah. After they got they got signed, it's the best thing in the world. It's like winning the lottery. Then they had to like put the work forward because. They didn't get signed to anything. They got a 360 deal or they got, you know, and they have the prestige of, okay, this label's managing me, man, managing me. Um, and really they're just kind of like, I don't know, taking advantage of you or just waiting for you to, to deliver the funds, um, or waiting to see if you take off. And then I, I have a, I have a friend in particular, I have a couple of friends that, uh, that have gotten signed recently. And I, I've actually, um, booked this one person in particular. For a number of events, I, I treated her really well. Uh, she got signed to a major label and she just, and I'm, you know, following her and she, I'm, I'm worried about her because she doesn't really know how to represent herself. She admits to it. Uh, and m- maybe they care about her, but she signed to like a five year deal. So she could end up in a really tough situation. Um, if it's again, one of those 360 deals. Um, I'm not going to tell her that I'm, you know, I'm just going to say I'm really happy for you, but you know, they want to, if somebody signs you, yeah, fine. Hopefully it'll work out. But I prefer to work with people that show me, show me the booking. Yeah. It's a good relationship. And then let's do it again. You you can't really tell people. It's like if somebody's in a bad relationship, even if you think it's bad, they've got to find it out on their own because they're going to take offense. Like, you know, they've they've got to discover things. And yeah, if somebody got a record deal, even if you know your experience, like my experience here is most people are going to be shelved. They're not going to have rights to their music. They're just going to waste a couple years of their life. But the way I see it at this point, trying to sign a, a you know major record deal in, at this time in 2022 
is like trying to is buying a home at the height of a housing bubble, and it's like, oh, really? You, I guess you'd never remembered 2008, did you? Uh, you didn't learn anything. Like you know, when when you look around and a great majority of your friends have become real estate agents, that's probably not sustainable. And, and the point is, is that. You can't really tell somebody that's got a record deal that it's bad for you because that's all they've wanted. They don't understand business. They don't really understand that. So they're just going to take it like you're jealous or something. It's like telling somebody, hey, maybe you should wait till the, the housing bubble corrects before you buy a home. No, Dan, you're crazy. We want a home. Everybody else is buying a home. Why shouldn't we buy, <laughs> you know? Uh, on that topic, this one person that I mentioned, she got signed to a previous record deal, big record deal. like a number of years prior and it was they were sort of the the, the label booked her put her under contract and then a, a basically a competitor and she ended up losing out because she produced a whole album under their uh, under their label and then they put it on a shelf somewhere they essentially bought her out so she got screwed out of a whole album out of like a couple of years of her life oh my god I just, I wanted to cry for her. I couldn't imagine being in that type of situation, but I hope she's not in that situation again. Yeah, hey, you can only hope the best, but like a lot of things in life, people have to experience things before they're willing to see it. And uh, I guess if you're a really good friend, you tell them, you know, if you can tell them, here's my view of it, but I hope that it doesn't go that way for you because my experience in 22 years in Nashville the majority of people that I know that signed to record deals, I would say 3% tops actually put out a record deal, actually had a career. The rest were a tax write-off. They didn't have rights to their music, and they ended up feeling like they were just really taken advantage of. And But they weren't willing to listen to that advice that you could have told them from experience on the front hand because – in their mind, it was all about getting a record deal, and that was the mark of success. But in the end, what is uh, getting a record deal? It's almost like signing a banknote for a home. It's only as good as the contract you signed, right? It's business. And essentially, that's where the ego comes in yes. at your expense as mm -hmm. an artist. Hey, I got signed to this. People care for 10 seconds, and then they don't care anymore. They look the other way. It's like – yeah. People care about your music. They care about the relationship they have with you. They they don't care nearly as much about the prestige. Yeah. I mean, okay, it's exciting. You play with this rock star or that pop star, but that that's not as long lasting as yeah. a, a continuous flow of music and and you know the connection that the, that that listeners have with you as an artist. And to me, ultimately, what I look at in life, you know, most of my life, I've kind of pseudo i would say be a i've been a slave to music because you know it, it's like it drove me now i look at music as a vessel for the greater things i i want to represent you know in in life and you know one of the things that's important to me is just hey being being happy that's the most important thing and one of the things that that is required to be happy is you have some level of freedom in your life and if you're in a situation where your label owns you and you almost feel like a slave, well, is that freedom? Is that happiness? And even if the happiness in the independent route takes longer, I like to tell an artist, hey, the real mark of success as an artist is 20 years down the road, you look in the mirror and you're happy with who you are and who you are is what your music is. It's not a facade. I mean, hey, there are people like Alice Cooper that you know go on and they put on a, a show and they have a costume or whatever, but you know, he's a great guy. No, but the point is it's about being authentic and having freedom, free range of motion, being able what to do what you want to do. And that's harder to to relay that message to people that are in that self-absorbed, I want to get famous thing. And I think those people have to go through that to kind of learn. But in the end, to me, it's about freedom. Do I like my life? Do I like the music I'm doing? Do I like the people I work with? And if not, then what can I do to redirect my ship to move closer to those goals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Having free reign also is really important. It's it's worth being a much smaller artist to not have like some I don't know private equity firm telling you what to do. Um, I see the pros and cons, but um, you know to have people that support you but don't 
breathe down your neck on every aspect of your presentation of your artists and professional presentation. I think that there's really something to be said about uh, the benefits of being more on the independent side, or at least not being as, as massive as a guy like Justin Bieber. Yeah. I don't know if he's happy. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, in Justin Bieber is probably being authentic to who he is, but I'm not Justin Bieber, right? And so I can respect that that might be the world that suits him, but that's not me and that's okay, right? And, but there's also the, 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 you know, uh, the business aspect we have to look at. It's, it's like, um, hey, you could have, you know, five million plays on Spotify and get your check for $500, right? And it might like really look cool to your friends that you got five million spins, but you know, is that paying your bills? Yeah. That just paid half a month's rent, you know, at tops. But the bottom line is when you're looking at, and you know, most week of food, you would say that again. So with inflation, it pays one week of food. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We're all dealing with, you know, this inflation, but you know, the bottom line is, not enough musicians understand business and know how to work a calculator. And, you know, you could take, say, an artist that has a, a major record deal that's selling 5,000 downloads or I guess it's streams or whatever. Not many people are getting the downloads. But, you know, when you look at the math of what you're getting when the label takes all their money away, you know, you could be an indie person and have 20,000 streams or 20,000 downloads and be making far more money and that's something I've examined that phenomenon for a long time. So just because this machine is offering you bigger status or, and a bigger audience, in the end, business and, and calculators do matter. What is your take home? And if you're not taking home more than you would as an indie, you're not in a very good business you know, relationship. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is, uh, are you pulling in an income to support yourself? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm pretty selective with the gigs that I take, for instance. Um, I sometimes like during when when situations are tough, you got to kind of curb that a bit and take gigs you may not sure. have, be as enthusiastic about. Um, so just kind of wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, we all have to like, I think there's that balance between right now I have to pay my bills and then making decisions that, um, that have a, a 10, 15 year strategy of where will this take me? Cause in other words, take a town like Nashville and I know producers, I moved to town and, and they would, they were doing these really horrible country pop demos for artists that couldn't sing in tune. Everything's auto tune. I remember talking to a buddy of mine and he just produced this, this record for this artist and he couldn't stand the music. He couldn't stand her talent. And she, uh, she came up to him and said, Hey, you know, how would you like me to represent you and your production company on my record? And he's like, Oh, you know, honey, I just want more room for you. You don't even have to mention me on it. And the truth was he hated the music so much he didn't want his name on it. Now, the the point is if you live a life like that, then you're going to attract more crappy country pop demos of artists that can't sing. You become that guy. And next thing you know, that guy's miserable. He got out of music completely and he's doing real estate because he wasn't happy doing what he's doing. So there's a balance that I think most musicians don't understand as entrepreneurs where, yes, there are cer certain things I have to do this month to pay my bills, but I've got to look at the work that I take and the career that I'm creating. Like, where does this take me in 10 years? Does it create opportunities that I like, people in my life that I like, that have ethics? You know, in other words, the, the ethical things that you make – take a longer time but if you're looking for that quick fix you know you might find that you're you're creating a life you're just not happy with and that's you know no money in the world is is worth that right yeah and uh you know that's probably what the, what's led to the great uh not the great recession but the great um what's the great what's reset the uh, great great reset the no great it's a different reset. word yeah, yeah. where were people were migration or basically, people were, have been leaving jobs by the droves. Oh yes, like, yes. What, great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Great Migration. Maybe that's it. Something like that. Uh, yeah, millions of people have been leaving the leaving their leaving their jobs because uh, they're just unhappy. They're just drained. 
This is post-pandemic phenomenon. Yes, I, I think it's very – because people are – they're looking at their lives different than just pulling a lever or, or you know, going to work. And, and they're, they're going, hey, my life has to have some meaning, and that life didn't have meaning. So there's more people – I think they're leaving the corporate job force – and they're creating their own businesses and entrepreneurs, you know, they, and they're and they're creating, they're trying to figure out why am I here? And I think that's the greatest question. And and for me, I'm at you know at my age, 48 years old, I know exactly why I'm here. And 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 some of the, and my road isn't an easy road at times, but I know why I'm here. I have a purpose, and it's a spiritual thing, and that drives everything. And and there might be some hard times because my route is not the easiest road, but it's the road that that is fulfills me and that I need to do. And and so, you know, our, sometimes it's important. And, and as us as artists, we can be that beacon of light to to show people, hey, when I look at you performing, I see happiness, I see peace. Your eyes, you're like, you're not faking it, you're not phoning it in. You've created a life that not only is desirable for you, but it inspires people. I mean, it inspires me just watching you. It makes me go, hey, maybe I should pick up breakdancing again. <laughs> uh, that's really nice of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's well, I'm, I'm pretty blown away that you're, you know, you know exactly what you want. Um, I, you know, I, I'm still, I'm still evolving and discovering myself as an artist. I'm, I'm always testing different genres. Um, I I'm not I'm not there. I can't I can't say I'm there yet. Well, I'm um, not there musically as well. To say I'm not there like I'm always going to grow musically. It's just my purpose and why God has me here and 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 the the overall purpose and music is just so the music's going to keep evolving. It's not like I don't think that will ever I like to say there was a a a cellist, a master cellist at 96 years old, somebody said, well, why do you still practice six hours a day? And he said, well, because I think I'm getting somewhere. So I wouldn't say that my music is like peaked out that I know that's going to keep evolving. Just my general purpose in life. Why am I here? What, you know, what is my purpose to inspire people? That is what I know. The music and how that that's going to go will keep evolving. Right. I think you're way ahead of most folks. Well, yes, and I and I feel blessed that I know, and th that doesn't mean it's been an easy road. Because to, to be c completely honest, with some of the things trials I've gone through recent in my life have been the the most tumultuous and the most uh, difficult. But at the same time, I know spiritually it's because I'm like you know climbing this mountain and I'm almost there, and so sometimes. When you're almost like you're at peaking to where you're supposed to be, you're going to get trials even more difficult to test you if you're really willing to go to that next level. And and that's what it is, is I know my spiritual purpose in the world and the music is secondary, whereas music was always number one. But now, I mean, there's times where I, I'm so busy doing other things, even outside of music, I don't even have time for several days to pick up a guitar and the old yeah. me would get very like insecure and go, oh, you didn't play, that's your worth or whatever. And I needed that when I was younger to gain the skills or whatever. It's just that now music is more of a vessel for the greater things I want to say in the world. And so even though I might be missing a little bit of technique by not picking up my guitar and I play a gig and it takes five minutes to get warmed up, but it's what I have to say, the life experience that I'm expressing through the music that means much more. If that makes oh, sense. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I love that. See, you know, I, I, I have to tell you, with every passing year, you know, things become a bit clearer for me, like as to where I want to go. You know, if I find that I want to hop out of bed every morning, um, then I'm, I don't, I don't really need a cup of coffee. I'm, I'm doing something right. So, generally, I, I feel really good about. I look forward to going to doing gigs. I look forward to, to live stream. I look forward to having fun with people on social media. Um, that's something I'm really grateful to be able to do. And I want to tell myself 10 years from now that I made the right decision. I gave up a number of really expensive degrees uh, to, to do what I, I felt um, would give me the most joy and in turn give 
the people around me the most joy. Yeah. The other thing that I really connect with, Suddenly, I have to, I have to do a sound check for stage in, in like a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. So we, want- we can wrap it up, but I was just going to say the other thing that I really connect with you about is the whole comedy side. You have this natural sarcasm in your posts and stuff. And I, and I, I look at them and like, you're one of those guys that comes up one and one in your feet. And I start laughing going, it makes me laugh. And so you clearly have that sarcasm that, uh, that I really connect with. And I love that extra touch. It's like, what is Asher doing now? And it's like something so random like that. And I start, you like the type of spit my coffee out my mouth type of effect. You kind of have the ability to do that for me, you know? I, I, Dan, you made my day. I appreciate it. Cause I, you know, a lot of folks like they, they don't necessarily comment when they, when they do like the posts, yeah. like they'll tell me in person. Uh, but I also have to be really careful about what I post. Cause there's a, people get offended so easily and some of my big supporters get offended easily. Not all of them, but uh, even if there's one, one supporter, somebody who like buys all of my singles, yeah. like my albums, I, I have to be careful about, I have to pretty much curb my post just for that one person somewhere out in Idaho. Like it's so difficult. Uh, I know to, to, yeah, cause you, you know, you can't do anything in life without offending people, you know? And, and so you almost kind of, by the way. you know, you sometimes you pick your battles, but, um, so I know you've got a new single called Atlantis coming out. You're doing a fundraising and fundraising mode and, or that was July 29th. Is that already out? That's out, right? That's out. Um, it's, I think there's like a day or two left, uh, uh, of the fundraiser. Okay. Um, on for it. And it's like in the link found dot com slash. Atlantis 2. Okay. Check the link. Uh, but the song's out, music video's out, it's on all major platforms, and um, I'm really excited about it. I hope people can check it out. It's it's pretty much the story of the last two decades of my life, about the cyclical up, ups and downs, and I hope people can, all of the world, just find, excuse me, project their own interpretation from their own lives. Um, if they're looking for encouragement or strength without, you know, without relying on any lyrics yeah well atlantis kind of brings up this connotation in my mind of creative creativity um imagination you know history all kinds of things that you know that are are very intriguing to me so i definitely can't wait to hear that song now how about where your socials your website tell us where people can find your music and get in touch with you so the, the easiest Easiest link is astrolab.com, A S H D R L A U B.com. And there's all my socials on the side. Um, I can send you a link to my found, uh, dot astrolab.com slash home, uh, landing page, which pretty much has everything on one page. The major links like my Deezer, iTunes, uh, Amazon, all my music on all those, uh, uh, Spotify, Pandora. So, uh, just look up my name, Asher Lab. I'm the only Asher Lab in the country. Awesome. Probably. Great. So I want to give a little tip of the hat to Top Track Studios. Uh, if you're in Nashville or anywhere and you want a great recording project, um, get in contact with Top Track Studios in Nashville. Uh, it's a great studio. Um, you've got Jessica, who is uh, the studio coordinator you can get in touch with. Gabron does all the mixing. He's the audio engineer. Great people. They're from Brazil, so you have to like them. Brazilian people are always very cool. Um, and you can find more episodes and music that I'm producing, my music, at www.musiccityrevival.live and we thank you for listening to episode number nine and we thank you Asher for spending some time with us and we look forward to seeing more and hearing more of your projects have a great rest of your day thanks Dad thanks for having me awesome take care alright have a good one as I fall